Well, good morning, church. Good morning. All right, so by hand clap of praise this morning, who else glad to be in the house of the Lord? I know I am. Amen. If you look around, we're missing a few folks this morning. Uh, you guys know why. Uh, we have the ladies on their uh, retreat this weekend, so we wish them uh, really safe travels. But, you know, more than that, we wish that they will draw closer to the Lord by what they've experienced this weekend. So uh, we want to pray over them as we begin our service this morning. So if you will, let's stand together. And uh, we're going to pray, and we're going to ask the Lord to come be with us. My name's Jeff, and it's, as always, it's an honor to be here to play these songs and just to uh, play this instrument and lift up the name of the Lord. And I pray that this morning that you will uh, join with us in doing that. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us. And thank you for just meeting us right where we were when you found us, God. You didn't wait until we were all cleaned up and presentable before you came to us. But more importantly than that... Thank you for not leaving us in that state. Thank you for taking someone that was broken like myself and turning him into something that you deem is worthy of entry into uh, your kingdom. So as we look forward to uh, the message this morning, I pray your blessings over Brother Ryan and the spoken word, the things that you have laid on him to uh, lay out to us clearly. We can understand your word and take those things and apply them to our lives. Thank you for the writers of the music. Thank you for the musicians that are on stage. And I pray that uh, we will be seen as one voice lifting up praises to a holy God through Jesus Christ, the Son, this morning. So thank you and pray that you bless everything that happens here. Uh, in your name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. What do you say we sing a little bit this morning? Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we see Yeah. 
is our strength. Amen. Let's give him all the honor and the glory he deserves this morning. Amen. Lift him up. Get it if you will. Praise God for how holy he truly is. And I want to read a passage of scripture to you from Revelation chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. And the Bible says, And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Our God is holy, and so we should worship him for those reasons. It's so great to have you here with us today. As Brother Jeff had said a few moments earlier, we have a number of women, a great, good, good group of women that are on a retreat at Pigeon Forge, and they are having a great, great time. We look forward for them to come back this afternoon, pray that they would have safe travels. I know the men, we miss them and can't wait for them to come back, and so we're looking forward to hearing what God has been doing there. We also want to make sure that uh, for those that are guests here with us, we do have some guests. Thank you for being here. There should be a connection card near you if you don't mind to fill that out. And there is a welcome desk out here in the foyer as you exit. If you don't mind dropping that off, we'll make sure to give you a free gift if you don't mind to drop off that connection card. Also want to remind everybody that there are shoe boxes that are by the doors. We're doing Operation Christmas Child Samaritan's Purse. And so if you can grab a shoe box and start packing that shoe box, those are due in November. I think it's the 8th. And you might notice also that we have a few pews that are missing some cushions. That's because the sanctuary renovation has started. This time next week, if everything is on schedule, all the pews are going to look different. And so the first thing that's going to be done is the pews, and then they're going to start doing the carpet. So we look forward to those changes in the near future. Also want to make sure everybody's aware, if you want to help out the ministry team that is doing a coat drive, you can contact Laura Turner and you can get information on how to donate or give a coat towards that ministry. Also, the online bulletin says something about a deacon's meeting today. We will not have that deacon's meeting just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So with all those things being said, why don't we go ahead and uh, have a time of prayer. And it is so great to be in the house of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are so good and you are indeed holy. And we come into your presence humbly, knowing that it is such an amazing honor to be able to worship such a holy God. And I pray today that we would just all draw near to you and not be concerned about anything else. God, we know that you're in control. And we pray for our women as they're traveling home, even maybe right now. And I pray you would keep them safe as they are on the road. We pray, God, that this service would be a service that just impacts our hearts, not, not just for information, but transformation, that we would become new creatures. And that if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, I pray, God, today they would repent of their sins and place their faith only in Christ to save them. Lord, receive our praise as we've gathered here because you are worthy of it and you alone are worthy of it. And we pray these in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So by a show of hands this morning, how many people are parents, have had children at one time or currently have children or anything like that? How many folks in the room are parents? Okay, so we have a good many, right? And of those, how many, how many of your children were children at one time? Small, right? So that includes us all, right? So as a parent, would you allow someone that has a track record of felons into your home to live while your children were children? Maybe they did some deplorable things that got them in a lot of trouble. Would you allow them to come stay in your house? No, I wouldn't. That's the, that's the man in me. They'd be like, no, you won't stay away. I'm protecting my own, protecting my children. But when you think about it on a broader scale, that's exactly what God does to us. He takes a sinful person and allows them to become part of his family. But it doesn't leave you in that sinful state. He redeems you. you go through the process of sanctification. And he gets you to the point where he accepts you anyway, regardless of the things that you've done in the past. Some people might say that that is a reckless act to allow someone into your home that you know is not worthy to be there. But God does that anyway. 
and he's allowed me to be a part of his family regardless of the things I've done in the past because of the sanctification process, because of his son, Jesus Christ, that died on the cross for my sin to cover those sins. That's exactly what this song talks about. It's called Reckless Love. Bye. 
Let's lift him up this morning. Church, will you stand with us? Sing along with us as Brian leads us this morning. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know, oh, I won't be shaken. Oh, I won't be shaken. My leader doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My leader doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My leader doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love.
Amen. Thank you so much, Jeff, and praise Van. Beautiful music today leading us to the throne room and worshiping the King of Kings. At this time, the children are dismissed to Children's Church. We're grateful for them being here. And as everybody is being situated, I had heard a story about a man that went into a do-it-yourself hardware store. And as he was going there, he found a worker and he said, where can I find some hammers and nails and a shovel and a bag of cement? And the worker said, well, they're under construction. And so the man replied, well, okay, well, you call me when they're ready. Is it all the women that laugh? I don't know why we don't have more of a response there. At any rate, uh, we as Christians are too under construction. God is not finished with us yet. And unfortunately, many Christians never realize the power of God that works within them. And so we've seen God's great power at work in our salvation. We were dead and we were disobedient and we were doomed. But Ephesians 2.4 says, but God. And then we saw that we were separated and we were alienated and we were without God and we were without hope. But Ephesians 2.13 says, but now in Christ, all believers are of the same family, we're of the same body, and we are all partakers of the same promise that we have in Christ Jesus, according to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. The power that worked all these things also works in every single believer. And so if you step back and say, it was a powerful thing for God to have saved me, that very same power works within you each and every day. And it's important for us as Christians to understand that. The book of Ephesians is divided into two sections. The first three sections is about our identity that we have in Christ. The last three, chapters 4, 5, and 6, are about the way we're supposed to live in, in, after the fact that we recognize our new identity in Christ. The Apostle Paul, before he gives the Ephesians instructions about how they're supposed to live in light of their new identity, he says, I know you guys need prayer in order for this to happen. And so in the last section of chapter 3, Paul is continuing his prayer for the Ephesians because he says, in order for you to be what God wants you to be, you're going to need God's power. You're going to need prayer. And so Paul is praying, and this is one of the more beautiful and powerful prayers, in my estimation, in all of Scripture. And so in saying that, let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Our text will be Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 21. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. If you have your Bible, turn there. If not, you're welcome to look at the screen and follow along. I'm going to be reading from the ESV Bible translation. So verse 14, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that 
Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Father, we come before you today and we just thank you for this very powerful prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed for the believers. And we recognize in this prayer some things that really are impactful on the way that we live our lives for Christ And I pray, God, that as we listen to your word, again, that this would not be merely instruction, but it would be transformation. God, we don't want just information here, God. I I pray that you would just work on our hearts as we are continually under construction, and you're doing a great work in our hearts and in our lives. And I pray today that you would be glorified above all else. We love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so from this prayer in verses 14 through 21... Paul is going to give us three instructions on how God will continue his work of construction in each believer's life. The first instruction is this, verse number one, uh, point number one rather, that we reflect on the character of God. And so if you want God to continue to work on your life, you need to continually reflect on God's character. We see this in four ways. Uh, These qualities are qualities that we see come up in Paul's mind as he is beginning his prayer. And just a reminder, at the beginning of chapter 3, Paul started to pray for the Ephesians. And then he chased a rabbit and then talked about all the great things that we have in Christ and the mystery involved in that. And now here in verse 14, he's picking up that prayer again. And he's telling us that as we're reflecting on God's character, we need to reflect on God's wisdom. Reflect on God's wisdom. You notice in verse 14 it says, for this reason. What is the reason that he is talking about there? The reason is the revelation of the mystery from chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. The mystery that is being spoken of there, it's not Nancy Drew and it's not Scooby-Doo, is it? The mystery is that as Christians, that we are all one family. That we are all citizens in the kingdom of God. Jews and Gentiles used to be hostile hostile people against one another, but the wisdom of God has interceded in a powerful way so that they become one. They all become partakers of the wisdom of God. Ephesians 3 verse 6, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And then you see in verse 10 that Paul says that God's wisdom is made known to the angels through the church. And so God's wisdom leaves these angels in awestruck wonder. And it should leave us in wisdom uh, in awe as well. Because our God is very wise. His eternal plan for the church shows that life is not full of just happenstances. But our God is in control and he is wise. God also has a plan for each of our lives. I want you to think about circumstances that have happened in your life that led you to faith in Christ. Think about significant events and how God was behind the scenes orchestrating all of those things. It should lead all of us to say, God, you are truly amazing. Earlier this morning, we were listening to uh, Brother Kevin teach a Sunday school class about how to be a godly husband, a lesson we all need. And he was asking us to give illustrate or to, to remember the time that we met our wives in a, the first date that we had. I think he was trying to stump us, maybe to make, make us look bad in front of our wives. But the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of us were able to tell those stories. But a lot of times we need to look even back further than that to see that God is the one that put all those things together. Our God is tremendously wise. So we reflect on his wisdom. We also need to reflect on his holiness. In verse 14, it continues, for this reason, what does he say next? I bow my knees. Now, this is not saying that the only way you can pray is to bow your knees. We see examples in the Bible of people standing when they prayed. We see some sitting while they pray. We see some cases where they're falling on their face in prayer. But bending the knees is a picture of humility 
And it's a picture of reverence. And this points to the fact that as Paul is thinking about the mystery of God and the mystery of our salvation, it leads him to fall on his knees and say, God, you are in a holy God. God, you are a majestic God. You are far above. You are pure and you are separate. It leads me to the point that prayer is about worship. When you pray, don't pray just to check a box saying, well, I prayed today, now I can live my life for myself. But prayer is about coming in the presence of God and lifting up the King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen to Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. It says, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And so that passage reminds me of how important it is that we humble ourselves every single day. To deny ourselves and to say that this day that I'm about to live is not about me. And there have been various points in my own Christian life where I've made it a practice where every day I want to actually get on my knees. And whether you literally get on your knees or not, there needs to be the humbling of ourselves before God. I believe that getting a vision of God's holiness will help us to see our own unworthiness. In Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet saw God in the temple. He was sitting on the throne and he saw these seraphim angels crying out threefold, holy, holy, holy. And when Isaiah saw that holiness, his response was, woe is me. For I am a man of unclean lips. He saw God's holiness and immediately seeing God's holiness, he saw his own sinfulness. In Luke chapter 5, Peter and the boys were fishing and they were out all night and they couldn't catch a thing. Jesus comes on the scene and he says, put your nets over there. And then all of a sudden there were fish more than they could even handle. And immediately Peter knew he was in the presence of of a divine and powerful and holy God. And he fell on his face, the Bible tells us, and he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Both of those passages in Isaiah 6 and Luke 5, it teaches us that when we get a grasp on how holy God is, it humbles us. It helps us to recognize that life is not about us. And so when you pray, you need to remember that you're praying to a holy God. This truth should lead us to our knees in desperation for his mercy and his grace. And as we're continuing to reflect on the character of God, we've seen we need to reflect on his wisdom and his holiness. But as you continue to read there in verse 15, it says, From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Now, this is not saying that God is the father of all people. We know the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, that he is the spiritual father of those he adopts. And so if you are a genuine believer in Christ, you are a child of God. But the Bible tells us in John chapter 8 that if you're not adopted into God's kingdom, you're a child of the devil. And so you're not his, he's not your father in that sense. But this expression is about the father's rule, his control, and his authority over all things. And so when we pray and when we enter into God's presence, we need to recognize that he is in control and we need to give up control of our own lives and we need to start learning dependence upon him no matter what we're going through. And so as we're continuing, we've reflected on his wisdom and his holiness and his sovereignty. And the fourth reflection is on God's grace. This is a characteristic of God, that God is gracious. We've seen that he is all wise, he is holy, and he is sovereign, and we deserve judgment and God's wrath for our sin. And yet, instead of wrath, God gives those who believe in him his grace. It's an amazing grace that he gives us. The Bible tells us in verse 16 that he grants it to us. It means he gives it to us. We saw in Ephesians chapter 2 that it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In verse 16, Paul calls it the riches of glory. It speaks of the fact that our Father is rich and He is powerful. And Paul prayed that God would use those resources to strengthen believers to realize that they have God's power and resources working in them and through them. Our God is indeed a gracious God. And so as we reflect on these four characteristics of His character, we see how desperately we need him each and every day of our lives. If we are to live lives that are pleasing to God, if we're to live lives where we're allowing God to work 
construction on us and make us everything he wants us to be, we need to have an accurate understanding of his character. He is wise, he is so holy, he is sovereign, and he is gracious. But there's a second instruction here as we carry on in this text in verses 16 through 19. It is not only that we need to reflect on the character of God, but we need to receive strength from the Spirit. Receive strength from the Holy Spirit. This section is the content of the prayer for the Ephesians. He simply prayed that the Holy Spirit would strengthen them to know Christ's power and to know His love. And so from this prayer, he teaches us three ways that we can receive strength from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential for us as Christians to be able to do anything good for the kingdom of God. Someone once said, if God took the Holy Spirit out of this world, most of what we Christians are doing would go right on. And nobody would even know the difference. But church, I want to share with you here today this very important truth. Without the Holy Spirit of God, we cannot do any good for God's kingdom. We cannot work God's power through us. We cannot show God's love through us if the Holy Spirit is not working in us and through us. And so I want to share with you three ways to receive strength from the Spirit. If you want to be used by God, you need to make yourself available to the Holy Spirit. And these are three ways in order to do that. Number one, you surrender to His rule. You surrender to the Holy Spirit's rule in your life. That is that if you imagine your heart to be a throne, who's sitting on that heart's throne today? Is it yourself and what you want or are you allowing the Holy Spirit of God, to sit on that throne. As we look at verses 16 and 17 here in a moment, I just want to ask you this question. How much of your life do you focus on the outer and the materialistic? A lot of times when we get up in the mornings, we make sure that our hair is a certain way and and the way we dress is a certain way and and all of that kind of stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. We invest a lot of time in doing those things But what Paul points to here in verses 16 and 17 is not the outer person, but the inner person. And sometimes we spend so much time on the outer person that it's to the neglect of the inner person. The fact is, is that Christ's power is available for the inner person. And let's read about that as we continue here in verse number 16. It says, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power. Here it is through his spirit, in your inner being. So what is the inner man or the inner being that he's talking about? Well, that's the spiritual part of a person that God lives and works. So your inner being, your spiritual being, that is where God is doing his work in you. How much of that are you giving over to God? Because what you do, what you allow God to focus on, on the inner being, will affect everything on the outer being as well. The Bible speaks about the fact that the inner person that is a sinner is dead in their sins, according to Ephesians 2, 1. But, as we keep reading in Ephesians 2, it becomes alive with Christ when we allow Jesus to save us. When Jesus saves us, we are no longer dead, but our inner man, our inner being, is brought back to life. And there is spiritual life, there is spiritual vitality inside of you. You're no longer dead. You're now able to worship. You're now able to pray. You're now able to have fellowship around the Word of God and understand what God wants you to do. God does that great work in you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul also wrote, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Listen to this. Our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. There's very little that you can do to make your outer self look younger and younger. You can cover it up, you can conceal it, do different things, right? Some of us try to do that. But the inner person, it can be renewed every single day. As you get weaker on the outside, we can get stronger on the inside. And so this leads us to verse 17. And so in reading that, it says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul is further praying that Christ may dwell in our hearts. Now, it's important for us to understand that both 16 and 17 speak of the Holy Spirit strengthening the spiritual life of the Ephesians. And the word dwell that's mentioned there in verse 17, 
It speaks not only about Christ living in us, but it speaks about him inhabiting us and settling down in our hearts. It carries the idea of a permanent resident, not somebody that's here for a short period of time. Jesus is not on a visitation program. He wants to be a permanent resident. He wants to make his home inside of your heart. How many of you have ever moved to a new home before and it took you a while before you got comfortable? Maybe you moved there and your furniture wasn't there and it just looked like empty walls and an empty room and you said, this doesn't really feel like home yet. But when you move your furniture in and you start spending time there and you start making memories there, that house all of a sudden becomes a home. Well, this is what the Bible's talking about here. Jesus wants to make the house, you, he wants to make it a home. He wants to be comfortable there. And so how can we go about doing that? Well, there is a book by Robert Munger. It's called My Heart, Christ Home. And in that book, he pictures the Christian life as a house and through which Jesus is going from room to room. So just follow along with me as I, as I share what he wrote here. He says, in the library, which is our mind, Jesus finds trash and all sorts of worthless things, which he proceeds to throw out and replace with his word. In the dining room of appetites, he finds many sinful desires listed on a worldly menu. In the place of such things as prestige and materialism and lust, he puts humility, meekness, love, and all the other virtues for which believers are to hunger and to thirst. He goes through the living room of fellowship, where he finds many worldly companions and activities. And then through the workshop, he only finds toys that are being made. And then into the closet, he finds hidden sins that are kept. And so on through the entire house, Jesus looks into our lives. Only when Jesus has cleaned every room, every closet, and every a corner of sin of foolishness, could he settle down and make the house his home. And I'm hoping today that you would allow Jesus not merely to have you as his house, but to have you as his home. How do we do that? One way is we allow the Holy Spirit to reign in our hearts. We submit to his reign. Galatians 5.16 says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You do what God wants you to do. You live according to God's will, not your own will, not what you want to do. John 14, 23, this verse has impacted me tremendously. Listen to it. Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. That beautiful verse talks about Jesus dwelling within us, not just a little temporary program, but a permanent residence where he will make our house his home. And so the first way we receive strength from the Holy Spirit is we surrender to his rule. Secondly, as we continue in this passage, we need to grasp his love, grasp the love of God. See, this passage is like a staircase. Paul is building upon the fact that when we allow Christ to rule in our hearts, we will then begin to grasp the love of Christ in a greater way. As you are living for Jesus, you're going to start understanding how much God loves you more and more. If you're not living for Jesus and you're living for yourself, you might even get to the point where you wonder if God even loves you. And so as Jesus settles down in our lives, he begins to display his own love in us, but also through us. And so the way we're able to love other people is to comprehend and apprehend the love of God that he has shown us. You see, the greatest love story is not a Shakespeare play, and it's not about a Disney princess. The greatest love story is about God's love for his people. God's love for his people. There is no greater love where vile and wicked sinners who are enemies of God have been reconciled to God because God loved them so much that he sent his own son to be brutally killed on the cross. There's no story that is even comparable to the love of God. And we are only able to love like Christ as we begin to understand his love for us. What is God's love like? Well, it is selfless. It is giving. It is an agape love. It is an unconditional love, a love that we don't deserve. And so when the Spirit empowers our lives, 
we find ourselves wanting to serve others. And all of a sudden, we're going to want to sacrifice for them. And we're going to want to serve them. And those things that used to occupy our mind and those longings that we had in our heart, we no longer desire those things like we once did because we want to love God and we want to show our love towards other people. So how does this happen? Christ's loving nature, as we walk in Him, becomes our nature. And we begin to love others the way Christ would love them. If someone is habitually unloving, they have habitually resisted Christ as Lord of their hearts. Just like we don't have to be told to breathe, even though my watch sometimes tells me, okay, you need to breathe. I'm, I'm not sure. What, I, I knew that I needed that. At any point, Christ led believers naturally demonstrate the love that they have for Christ. Just like you don't have to be told to breathe, you don't have to be told to love. If you're following Christ, you're going to love. In verses 17 through 19, we see that as Paul prayed for the Ephesians, he wanted them not only to know about Christ's love, but here's the key. Not just to know it, but to experience it as part of their daily lives. In fact, as you look at verse number 19, it says, And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And that, that beautiful passage uh, came after verse 18 that says, May have strength to comprehend. That word comprehend that I want to focus on really could be translated to apprehend. And the difference between a comprehend and an apprehend is that to apprehend means to take hold of or to grasp, to experience at a deeper level. So we, God it wants you to know his love, not just in your head, but he wants you to experience it every single day. And so there are really three aspects in this passage about God's love that we need to grasp. We need to grasp, that, grasp the security of God's love. If you look in verse 17, it says there that we have been rooted and grounded in love. The word rooted, of course, is a picture of a plant or a tree. And as you understand, as the roots continue to go deep, the more secure the plant or the tree is. The word grounded there is a picture of a foundation of a building. And so the deeper the foundation, the more secure the building is. And Paul is saying, I want you to know how secure you are in Christ, as though you are a plant with deep, deep roots, as though you are a building with a deep, deep foundation. You see, the fact is that if you don't go deep, you can't go high. And it's important for us to recognize what we have in Christ. We have security. But also, we need to grasp the fullness of God's love. In verse 18, look at this description here. It says, they have strength to comprehend. Again, the Holy Spirit's given this revelation of strength to comprehend with all the saints, all Christians, all the church. Here it is. What is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth? Speaking of the love there. All this means is to understand the fullness of God's love for you. Listen to this. God's love goes in every direction, and it goes to the greatest distance. It goes wherever it is needed as long as it is needed. And these terms suggest the vastness and the completeness of Christ's love for his children. It is indeed an extraordinary and a reckless love. God reaches down to the lowest levels of depravity to redeem those who are dead in their trespasses and in their sins. God's love can reach any person in any sin, and it stretches from eternity past to eternity future. Psalm 103, verse 11, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove his transgressions from us. That is the extent of God's love. That's the fullness of God's love. And Paul's saying, I'm praying that you will know more about that love every single day. I pray you wake up every morning and you never feel lonely because you know God loves you. You know you are wrapped in his love. Be comforted by that, Paul is saying. And so we know his security, we know his fullness, but we also grasp, listen to this, the endlessness of God's love. The idea is that it is not about mere head knowledge, as we see there in verse 19, to know that the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It's not just about, yeah, I know that God loves me, but to experience it, to taste it. It's not mere intellectual appreciation that we have of God's love. It means that we can never get to the bottom of it. 
For all eternity, we will adore God for his infinite love for us. Jeremiah 31, 3, God told Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Romans 8, 38 through 39, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor debt, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is an endless love. God will never stop loving us. We don't deserve it, and there's nothing we can do that will cause God to stop loving us. That's the love that Paul is praying. Grasp that. If you can grasp that, it's going to change your lives. And then we see thirdly, as we continue up this staircase, that we need to experience his fullness. There it says there in verse 19 that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And so if you're following the staircase, Christ is reigning in our hearts. Then we begin to know and to grasp and to experience his love. And then as we go to that next step there, what is it? We begin to be filled with all the fullness of God. That phrase there is speaking about maturity. It speaks about growing up in Christ. God has saved you for the purpose of making you more like Jesus. And I want you to understand today, when you were saved, don't think, well, I was, you know, Jesus is here and I'm like right there. No, <laughs> not even close. And none of us were even if you spent your whole childhood and you've been at church every time the doors were open, chances are you might be wrestling with the sin of self-righteousness and the pride and things of that nature. We were far off from where Jesus is in his holiness. We have severely missed the mark. And yet the Holy Spirit takes us where we are and little by little, day by day, is making us more like Jesus until that point when we're glorified, where we will see him as he is, we will be even like him in his holiness. It's going to be a tremendous time. So we experience his fullness. We're being renovated by God. The fact is, is that in the next few weeks, you're going to see some things in the sanctuary that look a little messy. And God's work of sanctification is a little messy sometimes. Sometimes we have some habits that are hard to kick. Sometimes we have some addictions. Sometimes we have some problems that we're just not surrendering, just not going over. Just like I talked about our, our bodies being like a home or like a house. Some of us have a lot of closets full of a lot of sins that nobody else knows about. God knows about those, and he's trying to kick the door and say, let me have them. Let me cleanse you. Let me forgive you. And yet sometimes we're not willing. Renovation means that there's some work to be done. He's making us all that he wants us to be, and we need to say, okay, I'm yours. A lot of times we say, yes, God, you can save me, but then we start to set the parameters on what we are allowing God to do in our lives. The same power that saved us is the same power that is wanting to clean us, to renovate us, to make us everything that Jesus wants us to be. The fact is that it's possible that we know a lot about a car you might know about its engine and all the various parts of an engine and how it works, how the ignition works, how transmission works, and yet you can know all of that stuff and never take a car out for a ride. Unfortunately, many people know a lot about the Bible, its doctrines, its promises, various interpretations, but they don't live by its truths. And God wants you to do more than just gather facts. He wants you to experience his fullness. He doesn't want you to live with a mediocre relationship with him. He wants you to draw near to him. He wants to change you. He wants you to use you to build his kingdom. And that is what he does. And you might say, well, I'm not strong enough for that. And he says, exactly. That's exactly right. Which leads us to this next point. That we need to remain in awe of his glory. The final instruction that Paul gives here in these verses is we need to remain in awe. We reflect on God's character. We receive strength from his Holy Spirit, but we remain in awe of his glory. And after reflecting on his character and receiving his strength, believers should be filled with praise. Our heart should be overflowed to say, God, you're an amazing God. It's not about me, but you are an amazing God. This doxology exalts God for his power. I see this in three ways. Number one, we need to praise him for the greatness of his power. Paul was confident. Listen to this now. Stay with me. Paul was confident that with God's power, Jews and Gentiles can live out their new identity 
and they could love one another. And so as he starts chapter 4 here, next week we're going to start looking at it. As he starts doing that, he prays, Now unto him who is able to do this stuff, in his mind he is thinking, if he can take a Jew and a Gentile, they hate each other, but if he can make them one and help them to love one another and advance his gospel, what can't our God do? It is a great, great power. What seemed impossible at the time, Paul said, I know you are an able God. In verse 20, listen to it. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. We see that God is able. Able to do what? Notice all these phrases that Paul heaps up in praise to God. God is able to do more, but that's not all. He's able to do far more, but that's not all. He's able to do far more abundantly. But that's not all. He's able to do far more abundantly than we can ask. But that's not even all. He can do far more abundantly than we ask or even think. And that word think there means to even imagine. That is the extent of the power of God. God can do more in response to one prayer than we can with a thousand years of planning. Do we believe that God alone is able Whatever situation is going in your life, do you believe that God is able, that God is strong enough to handle it? You say, well, yeah, you know, in my mind I say that that's true, but do you really experience that? Or do you go to something else whenever there is an issue? You might think at times, if you're honest, that God doesn't care for you. Maybe you feel that way. But Paul is reminding us today that he loves you with an everlasting love. The God who loved you before the foundation of the world and the God who will love you for eternity future will love you today through whatever you go through. You might think that God's not strong enough for whatever it is that you're dealing with. And Paul is stressing here in this doxology, in this hymn of praise, that God is able to do far more abundantly than you ask, far more abundantly than you can even think. Our God is able. So for what do you need this able God today? Let's carry on. There's more on that in just a minute. But we see that we need to praise him for the greatness of his love, his power rather. Secondly, praise him for the location of his power. The location of his power, it's very clearly seen there at the end of verse 20. Within us, and then in 21 it says, to him be the glory in the church. And so if that wasn't reason enough, what we saw there at the beginning of verse 20 to praise God, now we have even greater reason to praise God because it's not about an external force working. It's about a power within us that God is working in us and through us. This omnipotent God provides his resources for us to serve him and advance his gospel. If you've thought about the Great Commission and what God's asking us to do, sometimes it's overwhelming. Wow, we got to go to every tribe, every nation, reach all the people, share Christ with everybody that we know, try to love everybody, try to serve everybody. How in the world can I do any of that? And the answer is, you can't. But you can do a little bit, and you can do a little bit, and you can do a little bit. And as we do what God wants us to do, and as we're filled with his power, God moves, God works, things change. Remember that God has saved Christians and empowers them to make eternal significance. Remember, we can't expect God to unleash His power in our lives until we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have to be submissive to His reign in our hearts. We have to accept and demonstrate His love. We have to be filled with His fullness. And everything, if you think about the life of Paul, everything Paul did was in the power of God. And he saw God do big, big things. He relied on God's power, and God did big things. So, church, we need to imagine big things through Christ. And God can do more. We need to start praying and asking for God to do big things. And God can do more. What are these big things What are things that you want to see God do in your individual lives? What are ways you want to see the gospel spread to the uttermost parts of the world? Here are some thoughts that I had. God can save even the vilest of sinners. You might have someone in your family that is hard. Every time you talk about religion, I don't want to hear about that. 
That was my best imitation of their voice, right? Some of them are, are just that hard. You, you do your religion, I'll do my life. I'm happy, leave me alone. And the only way you feel like you can ever even talk to them is if you don't talk about Jesus or don't talk about family. God can save them. We need to be asking. God can resurrect even the deadest of churches. God's power can do that. God can heal even the most broken marriages. God can do that. But we have to ask it. We have to think it. And we have to give it over to God. It's not our power. And God can humble even the proudest of nations. We need to start praying God-sized prayers and understand that only His power is able to do some of these things that we imagine. The point is, is that when we look at ourselves, we see that we're not strong enough. And God says, that's the point. You're not strong enough. You can't do anything in your own strength. But our God is able, and He is in us, and He is working through us. So we must humble ourselves and learn how to depend upon His strength. John 15, 5, I feel like I'm saying this about every verse, but again, this is such a great verse. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. And here's the last part. If you don't get anything else, I want you to hear this. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Some of you like to fix things, and you've been trying to fix your own life. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. Some of you try to work for God, but you're doing it in your own strength. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. So we praise him for the greatness of his power and the location of the power. Real quickly, let me get this final thought here. We praise him for the purpose of his power. Why does God do these things? And the reason that we serve, the reason we love, and the reason that God's power works through us is very clear here in verse 21. To him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. His glory is said to be throughout all generations forever. We have a glorious God who has always been glorious and will always be glorious. And God is inviting us to join his cause. He's inviting us to trust that you have significance. You have a purpose. You have been saved. You, furthermore, you've been created to glorify God. And so if you're living a life that is not glorifying God, you're missing the mark. And God has brought you, he has saved you and reconciled you to say, I've saved you for this. You have been created for this. And you will never find the joy you were created for if you live for anything other than God's glory. So, God's great power can save. Without Christ, you are dead but God can raise the dead. And for those of you who are saved today, God's great love and power should cause all of us to do spiritual inventory, looking at your life as though it's a house. Jesus is going in your mind, going in all the different shops of your house. What is he finding? Is there anything displeasing to him? If you have your own home and there's something you don't like, you're going to put that thing in a yard sale. You're going to put that thing by the dumpster. You want to get rid of it because you want to make your house a home. There are things Jesus sees in your life. He says, this is not my home. I'm not comfortable here. Because when Jesus is comfortable, he stretches out. He begins to love and love through you. So I want to invite us to let him search our hearts that we might fulfill his purpose as individuals, but also as a church. We're going to have a time of response here in a moment. I'm going to open these altars here. I'll have counselors over here in just a moment if you need to go to them. And some of you here today need to be saved. God's power can save you. You say, preacher, you don't know what I've done. I don't, but I know that God can save you. Jesus went to the cross because of that you've done. No matter how vile, no matter how wicked, no matter how rebellious you think it was, Jesus died a gruesome death so that you'd be saved. Trust in him today. And for everybody else, I want you just to do spiritual inventory. What does God want to do in your heart and in your life today? Are you allowing God's power to work through you? Are you grasping and apprehending the love that he has for you? And if he just goes through your life as though it's a house, is it a home to him? Or is there something keeping him from being comfortable? Let's pray and then we can respond to him. It's not about just knowing Jesus 
no one about Jesus. It's about knowing him. So let's pray that we would just know him for all that he is. God, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And we pray that you would work in our hearts and work in our lives. God, your word is so powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's like a hammer that breaks our heart. And I pray today, God, we would just respond in obedience. You're not going to be comfortable dwelling within us as long as we are living in disobedience. And I pray today for anyone that claims the name of Christ that is living a life of rebellion and disobedience. God, I pray that you would break them today and help them to realize how much time that they've wasted and pray that they would get right with you today. And God, if there is a person here today that is lost, I pray today that they would see that they can be saved by God's grace. They can't earn it. They can't earn it by religion or by being a good person, but God, they can be saved when they trust in who you are and what you've done. God, you loved them so much, you died on the cross for them, and I pray that they would see that there's salvation nowhere else except for the name of Jesus. God, just do your work amongst us. The same power that saves us is the same power that wants to work in us and through us. And I pray that we would just respond by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a time of invitation, a time of response. I want to invite you to stand. The musicians are going to come forward at this time. I'll have counselors over here at this door. You're welcome to come to me if you'd like to. I'll be up here in the front. But God's word is spoken, so we need to respond. But we can't harden our hearts when God has spoken. Is your house, is it a home to Jesus today? Are you saved today? Is God wanting you to join this church? The most important thing for us to do right now, more important than anything else, is for us to be obedient to Jesus. What does he want you to do? As we sing this song, let's obey Christ.
thinking about our God as we run to him, he receives us. And so we can rejoice in that. It has been such a great blessing to worship with you today. I hope you've been blessed. Praise God for what he's doing in the church and in each of your lives. Uh, just a reminder that tonight OCD will be at the park at 5 o'clock. The youth will meet over at Cecilia Smith's home. Is there another word of announcement real quickly? Nobody else has anything? Be sure to greet those that are our guests. God bless you and thank you for being here. And uh, just remind you to go by the welcome desk when we are through here. If there's nothing else, I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Enjoy the pretty weather. And we have a sing out, so why don't we sing out praise to Jesus at this time. Holy is the Lord.